Now we're going to turn to the algorithm. How does contrastive PCA actually work? And are there theoretical properties of contrastive PCA that allow us to use it with confidence? The underlying algorithm for contrastive PCA is very intuitive. We start with a target data set that consists of n samples with d features. We take this data matrix and we compute the covariance matrix associated with it. We do the same thing with the background data. We go ahead and compute the covariance matrix of the background data. Then we take the weighted difference of these covariance matrices. Cx here is the covariance matrix of the target data. Alpha is a weight. Cy is the covariance matrix of the background. And this difference here is going to be a symmetric matrix. We go ahead and compute the SVD of that matrix, the singular value decomposition. And then the singular vectors give us the contrastive principal components on which we project the data. And this is just a toy example in two dimensions. Here we have the target data set in blue. If we were to do PCA on the target data set, what we would find is that the principal component direction is indicated here in the red dashed line because that's where most of the variation is. On the other hand, if we were to do contrastive PCA with the gray points as the background data set, we would find that the contrastive PCA is almost or the, the contrastive PC is almost orthogonal to the PCA direction. And this is because this is the direction where the target data set has some additional variation relative to the background, because the background has just as much variation in this direction. And if we end up actually projecting the target data set onto this green solid line, what we end up finding is we discover two different clusters that appear very clearly when projected into this one dimensional subspace or line. Okay, so let me just repeat that in more mathematical notation. So if you're trying to do contrastive PCA and you start with two data matrices, they should already be centered. What you do is you go ahead and compute the covariance matrices, X transpose X and Y transpose Y for the target and for the background. Then you go ahead and solve this optimization problem here. And what this is basically saying is that let's find the unit vector such that it has the highest uh, variance in the direction of CX minus it has the lowest variance in the direction of CY, okay? And the, the weight alpha is introduced to balance these objectives. So in some cases, you may be more interested in uh, finding a vector that has a higher target variance. And in other cases, you might be more interested in get finding a vector that has a lower background variance. And we'll return to this. But the nice thing is that this optimization problem can be reduced by factoring out the V transpose V. And this optimization problem can be solved efficiently by simply doing an eigen decomposition of the weighted difference. Okay, um, let me just again give a simplified picture of what's happening. So if you have a target data set, you can go ahead and plot the spectrum of X, right? So this is just the eigenvectors along with their associated eigenvalues. Um, here, we can see that the the first few eigenvectors, or singular vectors rather, they have the highest singular values. Now, if this was just regular PCA, these, were the, these would be the ones that would be returned. But in the case of contrastive PCA, that's not what happens. Contrastive PCA says, hold on, let me see what about, what's happening in the background. If the background has a similarly high singular value in that direction or for those singular vectors, then those are not returned by contrastive PCA. And instead we move on to the singular vectors that have a much bigger um, a difference uh, between the uh, X, which is the target data set, and Y, which is the background. Now this is a simplified picture for many reasons. Um, for example, this assumes that X and Y are simultaneously diagonal diagonalizable, um, but uh, this intuition carries into the more general case. Now there's one part that we haven't talked about yet, which is this uh, value of alpha. Let's understand what happens there. How do we choose an appropriate value of alpha? How do we balance this trade-off? Well, in practice, actually, what we do is um, we, uh, we actually have a method we've developed in the paper to automatically choose a good value of alpha. 
And the intuition for how that works is basically you can try a many, many different values of alpha. And what happens is that typically what you find is that there are certain regimes where you can change the value of alpha a little bit, but the projected data doesn't change too much. And so we've shown uh, this for 20 different values of alpha. And you can see there's definitely a very big difference between when alpha is zero versus when alpha is somewhere between 0.5 and you know maybe a little bit larger, um, it changes again in form for higher values of alpha. And finally, when alpha becomes very big around 300, it looks very different. And so our, automatically, uh, our method for automatically selecting good values of alpha chooses values of alpha that capture behavior over large changes in um, uh, the values of alpha. In other words, it picks a few representative examples and shows this to the user. So it says this here is a good value of alpha to check out. This is a good value of alpha to check out. Maybe the patterns that you're interested in are expressed in one of these values of alpha. And more details about this automatic selection of alpha, why it works, can be found in the paper. The other thing is if um, you as the analyst desire more fine-grained exploration, you can actually tune values of alpha. And you can generate these nice uh, videos, which basically uh, change the value of alpha and look at how the the, the points ch uh, change as a result. And this can actually provide additional intuition for how uh, for patterns in the data and how different uh, points may be closer to one another. Finally, let me talk about certain theoretical properties, um, actually geometrical properties of contrastive PCA. This is something that's actually quite, quite interesting. Um, now, unlike PCA, where there's a very clear objective, there's a, very, there's a single objective, and that is, let me try to identify the vector or vectors that have the highest variance. Contrastive PCA tries to do two things at the same time. You, it tries to maximize the variance in the target data set, but simultaneously, it's trying to minimize the variance in the background data set. And these two objectives, um, it, it, it may not be possible to simultaneous, simultaneously satisfy both of them. And so inherently, there is some trade-off. Um, but there is one thing that we can say for certain, that there are certain vectors that are more optimal than um, another set of vectors. So let me be more specific here. What I've done here is each of these dots represent one vector. And on the x-axis represents the variance of that vector in the target data set. On the y-axis represents the variance of that vector in the, in the background data set. Clearly, the vector that should be returned by contrastive PCA shouldn't be a vector over here. Like this vector, there's no reason for you to return it because you, there is another vector out there that has a higher target variance and a lower background variance, such as this one over here. But among the blue vectors, let's call them optimal vectors, among the blue vectors, you can make a case for returning different ones depending on how important each of these objective functions is independently. So here, you get a really low background variance, but A, your target variance isn't as high as it could be. Here, you get a much higher target variance, but this comes at the cost of an increased background variance as well. Now, here's the great thing about contrastive PCA. We can prove that by varying alpha, this hyperparameter that I mentioned earlier, um, CPCA can recover all of the optimal vectors. So for every value of alpha, there will be one um, for every vector out here, there will be one value of alpha that returns that to you. So there are no false negatives. By sweeping alpha, you can recover all of these. And what's really nice is that no value of alpha will ever give you a vector out here. You have no false positives. You only get optimal vectors with our algorithm. So with this, I'll go ahead and conclude. Um, so in these past few videos, I've provided an overview of contrastive PCA. The idea again is that we oftentimes we collect data sets in different conditions. Um, you might have diseased uh, patients that you collect data from as well as healthy patients. You could have multiple time points. You can have single groups versus heterogeneous populations. And contrastive PCA is a general method that allows us to discover interesting directions that are enriched in one of your data sets relative to the other. And what this allows us to do at the end of the day is to discover patterns that are unique or that are at least enriched in one data set, again, relative to the others. And as we've seen, um, the method has nice theoretical guarantees 
and it's uh, and it's very efficient. It has similar time complexity to standard PCA because at the end of the day, it's, just sol it's solving a similar optimization problem through eigen decomposition. With that, um, I'll just mention that um, we have a uh, GUI that you can install. Um, it's uh, it's a uh, Python package actually. Uh, it's you can just install it, install it by doing pip install contrastive. It comes with a GUI. It also comes with just standard um, Python code that you can use to run contrastive PCA on your own data. It, the, the library is modeled after scikit-learn. So if you've used um, the PCA implementation in scikit-learn, um, you'll find this very intuitive and the syntax very similar. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to comment on this uh, YouTube video, and I'd be happy to answer them.